topics that we continue d to discuss and two uh, uh, experts will uh, uh, describe it. This is the national response. The national response will be discussed by uh, Mr. Gabriel Mazouz. He's a computer and cyber department manager, Generations and Energy Group, Israel, in the electric cooperation uh, uh, of Israel. And the uh, uh, next speaker within this uh, topic of national response will be uh, uh, Rami Efrati, colonel, former research, whatever you like, Rami. Former head of civilian department of Cyber Bureau of uh, uh, Israel. The next topic uh, uh, connected to the international response will be uh, discussed by uh, uh, Dvora Hossein Curiel, the beautiful lady within the uh, team. Uh, she belongs to the uh, Associate and International Institute for Counterterrorism at ICC. She is also a uh, fellow in Tel Aviv University, Val uh, Neeman uh, Workshop for Science, Technology, and Security. And another speaker uh, regarding the international response will be uh, Ido uh, Moed, uh, a cybersecurity coordinator in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Israel. And if we will have enough time, I will uh, discuss my uh, uh, issues, the summary of the uh, uh, workshop. Usually I'll uh, discuss the uh, summary or my presentation at the end of the presentation of uh, everybody and open uh, the uh, uh, field of uh, discussion on all these kind of issues. So let's uh, start with our first presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Razani. Uh, like uh, Dr. Razani said, my name is Ophir Hasson, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, CyberG. Uh, before I start my presentation, a little bit, uh, um, I would say, details about my past. Uh, in the last, I don't know, about almost decade now, I'm dealing with cyber issues uh, if all, all from all kinds of aspects, from the technology aspect, from the offensive aspect, and from the defensive aspect. And I did that uh, through a few startup then in the, the Israeli security forces and then in the last almost uh, two years now, or year and a half actually, um, in, cy in uh, CyberGym together with the Israeli Security Corporation. My presentation, actually my short presentation will be uh, about the connection between our cyber, the Islamic uh, um, State, whatever name you want to call it, uh, the way they did uh, their job, the way they're acting, and the analogic, uh, I would say, with the cyber world and the cyber threat. Actually, I'm going to leave you with a lot of questions, not, not a lot of answers. Uh, most of the answers actually you will be facing uh, in the near future. Um, and this is actually my main topic. I will show you in the last slide um, our solution not exactly solution, but our approach to explain and to show and to uh, demonstrate uh, how easy is the threat and how dangerous is it. So really in the last almost decade, like I mentioned, uh, during uh, my previous presentation around the world, and also uh, especially in Israel, um, I'm trying to explain, I try to explain uh, I would say in, our organ in other organizations also in Israel, uh, I would say the characteristics that you see uh, uh, in the title that says that cyber and terrorism have no borders. Now before, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, it was only a theory. And I should ex explain in each presentation to give all kind of ex examples during the presentation, what exactly do I mean? And in the last few, few months, ISIS and other organizations actually um, doing what we um, try to say, try to say during the presentation in the last uh, few years. Now this is kind of a globus map, uh, show lines, some of them straight lines, some of them curved lines, and but they're actually uh, just lines, just borders on a page, on a picture. And 
we decided as, as the human nature, as a, as a population, as a nations around the world, the cities are that there is our geographical areas that we are going to live in, according to this line. But again, in the last few uh, weeks or months, there is organization like ISIS that says, listen, this is not the real geographical uh, environment that we think we need to live in. This is ju just lines that someone draw on a picture or on a piece of paper and say, this is, this is the borders, this is the uh, uh, geographical environment that we need to live in. Now, ISI said, listen, I want, a different, I want a different world. I want a different geographical environment. I want a different areas to live in. And he started to, p to paint all kind of uh, uh, areas, uh, all kind of, uh, uh, I would say, piece of lines that he decided that he's, he's going to use. Um, this is the first step. The second step is say, listen, this is not only uh, what I'm going to use, I'm going also to uh, control or to replace the parliament, replace the, the regimes in these areas and to say, listen, I'm going to run and to manage uh, this geographical env environment, sorry, this the geo geographical uh, piece of land according to my ideas, according to what I'm going to say, I'm going to replace your ideas. And he's going uh, forward. So listen, it's not going to be only the piece of land that I just saw you in the few, uh, the, the previous two slides. It's also going to be around the world. It's not going to cover all the world that you know. This is the vision. Okay, we can disagree on the vision, we can argue with the vision, but this is right now the vision um, as realistic as it can get uh, that ISIS is actually presenting. So he's going to replace all of us. He's going to replace all the governments. He's going to replace all the all the, um, um, the rules that we are living upon with his own rules, with his own uh, decisions, and with his own ideology. That's huge. When we're saying that's huge, we mean that there isn't any borders anymore. Now, uh, in secret time, the last <laughs> of, uh, military operation in Israel, we all the time discuss, speak, and say that there is a border between Israel and Gaza. There is a line. Somewhere in the map, there is a line. You can disagree where the, where the line is, but there is a line. According to the new threat, again, according to the ISIS uh, ideology, there isn't any line. I will decide where the line, and the line will not be geographical. That's a new threat, and that's, we need to think the new uh, way approach it, and the new ways to deal with this kind of threat, okay? So let's take it to the cyber war. When the cyber war had the same problem, when you're dealing with the cyber war, you cannot um, rely on lines, rely on borders, rely on nations, and say, listen, I'm going to deal with it only in my territory, geographical territory. I'm not going to, I'm going to deal with it only in Israel. Uh, I don't care what is going on in, uh, in Syria. I don't care what is going on in uh, Great Britain. I don't care what is going on in the US or in Asia or in Africa or whatever. I'm going to deal with it only in Israel and in, and in, in its own border, geographical border. What we are trying to say, uh, like I said in the last few years, that it's not the right solution, not yet. And my colleagues here, uh, especially Greg and others, the army of course, uh, travel around the world and say, listen, um, we cannot do it by ourselves. No one can do it by himself. No nation can deal with the cyber threat, the cyber world by, by himself and only by himself. They have to um, collaborate, they have to um, share information, knowledge, tools, experience, threats, enemies, uh, and all kind of um, and all kind of information that will help <coughs> as an international terrorism to solve and to deal with the cyber threat. So there is a few examples that uh, ISIS started started to uh, use the cyber world uh, to implement their own ideological uh, that I just mentioned uh, in the previous slides that I, that I presented. So. It's just the beginning. I mean, uh, the coalition of uh, 
organization started to find all kind of computers, all kind of information resources that says that they are going to use uh, the sites, the media, the internet, all kind of uh, infrastructures to use their own, uh, to implement or to expand their own ideological and their own ideas through the internet. And that's become an issue. I mean, um, the combination between the physical terrorism and using the cyber war, the internet, the infrastructure, and all that kind of stuff is actually causing us much bigger threat that you can imagine. Bear in mind that there is another border. And again, this is an additional example uh, that the ISIS doesn't limit itself to, to borders and geographical uh, uh, environment. Now, this is a, a, I will speak during this uh, short movie because um, this is actually emphasized that the cyber war, the cyber war and the cyber threat from our point, from the good guy's point, right? From our point of view, it actually has no borders. I can do whatever I want here from Israel to states, organization, companies in Asia that are located in Asia, that are located around the world. I don't have to cross any borders. I don't have to come to go over to, to a specific country, a specific <coughs> uh, a company to go over to their physical uh, location and start terrorizing their uh, infrastructure and their environment. I, I can do it from here. I can do it from, from my garage. If I have the right resource, I can do it whatever I want. So <coughs> actually the border is not a limit. It's not limit for me. It's not actually a, a, a barrier. I can do whatever I want. And it's very, very, very similar to the uh, physical uh, and the traditional uh, terror uh, threat. The main differences, and there is a few, between these two worlds, these two domains, is actually that in the cyber world, it's much easier. I don't need search. I don't need pickup trucks. I don't need that uh, uh, tanks. I don't need airplanes. I don't need nothing. I just need the right resource, the right people maybe, uh, a very good motivation, target, <coughs> and that's it. The barrier, the entry barrier is very, very low. I don't need, uh, I don't know, oil resource. I don't need banks. I just need uh, imagination, some resource so I can run the operation so I can run um, communication, connections, um, computers, e equipment, and so on, and that's it. So it's much, mu much, much easier, and the, modif and the differences between these two worlds is actually making it, make it, make it actually for us much difficult to deal with this kind of threat for the good guys at least. In the ISIS organization, you can see the flags, you can see the uniforms, you can see the pickup trucks and everything. But in the cyber world, I can be an actor. I'm standing here with a suit to give you a presentation, but probably, not probably, but maybe in the evening time I'm doing, uh, I'm actually changing sides and I become a bad guy. I can do that. I don't need a uniform, I don't need a flag, I don't have, I don't have, I don't actually have any kind of a pickup truck, whatever. I can do it from my garage and you will never know. You will never know. Now, <coughs> in the last few weeks, in the last few days, there is a big discussion about the recruit recruitment of people from uh, Western Europe countries uh, to the ISIS. And that's a big issue and everyone is actually speaking speak about it and, and wondering what to do and start to act uh, from a legal point of view and all kind of uh, uh, steps to stop this kind of uh, movement of threat. The cyber world is uh, a very attractive domain for young people. It's very, very, very attractive to act to a critical system, to see an offshore rig explode because of a cyber issue. That actually is very attracting uh, situation and attract a lot of people from around the world, especially young, very smart guys uh, that want to uh, satisfy themselves and satisfy their uh, um, uh, needs, needs to try their own tools, their own capabilities uh, on a real infrastructure. 
So if I will do that in a cyber room, and if I start to copy those kind of actions and missions that I'm doing, I'm probably going to attract a lot of young, creative, very, very smart guys from around the world to come and to work for, with me. <coughs> to work with me, to join my organization, to attack Silicon Fox attacks around, around the world, to attack companies around the world, to attack nations around the world. Because it's, it's, it's free. Now I don't, have to, I don't have to cause them to leave their home or their countries. They can do it whatever they want. Again, we're going back to the, the issue that there isn't any borders. <coughs> I can do it whatever uh, an actor is afraid of me. So it becomes much uh, challenging, much more challenging uh, threat from the good guys' point of view, from, from the nations, from the company's point of view, it becomes much more challenging. Because it's much more easier to, do, to, to become a bad guys and to conduct all kind of uh, um, actions around the world uh, from any kind of motivation that you would like. Now the risk, the, the, the risk is actually there. I, I spend a lot of time um, um, traveling around the world, um, auditing, uh, technical auditing and managing auditing, all kind of orga organization around the world, uh, nation nations even, um, international levels also. And I saw, uh, that actually in most of the cases, I saw that the organization are not prepared. In some of the cases, the organization even doesn't familiar, doesn't understand how big is the threat. They're still thinking it's a bug 2000. They, they still think that, th that it's not exist. They, feel, they still think that someone is actually trying to make money from this threat. They don't see uh, the incidents around the world. They, they, they ignore uh, the, the public incidents that happened around the world in the last few years. So they are not preparing that threat. They will s they will they're actually saying it's will not it will not happen to me. They're actually saying that um, we are not. It's a they actually will say it will not happen to me. I'm not a target. Uh, there isn't any reason that someone will attack me, and so on and so on. They are not preparing. There isn't any tools, mechanism, decision makers, uh, procedures, policies. <laughs> that implemented or in the organizations. There isn't any skills to a key members or key managers in the organizations that can solve, that actually can deal with this kind, with this kind of threat, with this kind of uh, incidents that, potential incidents that will happen uh, in their organizations. So think about it if one of these organizations will be attacked uh, by a cyber threat, by a cyber attack, uh, I would say a sophisticated one, not a simple one, but a sophisticated one, but maybe an international terror group, group is behind it. What will happen to this organization? They actually will have no idea at all, whatsoever, in any level that you would like, from a technical up to the senior managers, C-levels managers around the world. And I, I promise to leave you with the last slide. Uh, with a big question. This is uh, one of our systems that we started to develop. It's called Robotrix. Um, and you can drag, drag and drop a scenario, not just an attack, but a full scenario with a story behind it, uh, all kind of attack, and just launch it against some uh, critical infrastructure system, network infrastructure, whatever you decide and to see what will happen, to get some results, to get some feedback from uh, the system. Is that easy? I know that some of you guys will say it's not that easy, uh, it's not exactly the, uh, uh, this way that we are doing stuff, but actually it's very, very easy to do. <coughs> and if you're a good guy, you will probably notice the companies, you will probably say, listen, as part of the training that you are going, going through right now, this is the scenarios, this is the vulnerability that you are need to deal with. It's a national, it's a, it's a, I would say, 
full and comply with all your organization uh, organization systems and so on uh, and you have to deal with it because it's there and I can show you I can demonstrate on your system what will happen and that's a big question mark that I'm going to leave you guys with and thank you very much for your time because Dr. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ophir, for sharing this with us. And now I invited uh, Mr. Gabi Weinman to uh, present his presentation. Uh, good morning. And thank you, Eitan, for having me here. It's my sixth time. And uh, believe it or not, I think I'm the one of the few who was here during the first one. It's not that I'm that old. I started when I was 16. Uh, one apology. Uh, this is going to be show and tell presentation and a very fast one. I have 20 minutes to take you into the social media and terrorism world. And uh, so there are many slides and many things to share. So don't blink. If you blink, you miss two slides. <laughs> However, uh, there are some important slides. Most of them are not. But some of them, and I will highlight which one, are worth noting. So let me start with uh, with a recent example, uh, the Americans started launching a counter campaign online on Twitter, YouTube, and other uh, online social media entitled by Think Again, Turn Away. Uh, I won't go into it right now. It's a project uh, run by the U.S. Department of State, and one of the slides looks like that, uh, one of the videos, uh, and it's starting there are some reactions to it. And some are very fascinating and very fast one, only to show you how dynamic this world is. Now, this was posted four days ago uh, by the U.S. Department of State on September 6th. And it's, uh, you can see, run from the ISIS flag, it's one slide from the campaign. This was on the 6th of September. Okay, two days later, ISIS responded online. Yes, these are the guys on the trucks looking in the air, looking so primitive. <laughs> Not really. And they have their own version. <laughs> One is like, yeah, actually criticizing the U.S. Now, I use this only to show you what kind of world we are living in, in which uh, countries, states, organizations are exchanging blows, virtual blows online, using the new platforms of the Internet. Now, we are all fascinated, that's an understatement, by the recent uh, gruesome executions, crucifixations, beheadings online by ISIS using uh, free access to, to the world, using the Western platform online. Platform. But it didn't really start there. Terrorists were online from the late 90s, and they're always online in a way. This is just to show you and illustrate with them. Examples. These are the Chechen rebels. But they're hiding somewhere. Most of them, by the way, are now in another world. But uh, uniform, Kalachnikov, you can see it. Taliban fighter. Kalachnikov, terrorist on a computer. <laughs> All of them. Gadahan is speaks spokesperson in English. For Al Qaeda, two computers. More than a university professor has in his office. This is a banker captured by the US. Does this look like a school bank or classroom in a university or college? No, this is a Hezbollah bank. So I, I can go forever to have the idea. For many years now, terrorists have combined the weapons, the artillery, with online uh, platforms. Now, about our project, just to explain who I am a little. It's the 16 year. We started in 1998. This is an academic uh, project. We are not funded by army or by any Mossad or any counterterrorism agency. We are funded by academic grants for various sources. You can see some of them. We are monitoring uh, terrorist presence online since for 16 years. Archiving, downloading, archiving, uh, and analyzing. The analysis is look not just for the text, but also the visual aspects, from colors to pictures, videos, and so on. All our publications, all our reports are archived. This was my recent book, 
say on the internet that it's in 2006 and it is already outdated, old, irrelevant, don't buy it. The new book, in particular, is coming out um, by Columbia University Press in two months from now. That should be there in two months. Okay, so all our findings are reported, and you can see some of them, and you can find them online. So they're academics' work. Um, one of the recent ones, just published two months ago uh, by the Wilson Center, is called New Tourism and the New Media, focusing on what I want to present now right now, the idea of using social media. Uh, just to give you an idea, when we started this project, there were only two of us, and we only saw 12 websites. Today, it's not even today, uh, but in 2013, uh, we are monitoring over 9,800 tourist websites, and top of them is X. Uh, all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and others. Who are the terrorists using those platforms? Well, it's quite easy to answer, all of them. You want them to read the list? And the list is just growing. Every new terrorist group joins the platform. Why is it so useful for them? Well, I don't have to go through all the, nobody can regulate it, nobody can censor it. It's free for them. They can preserve their anonymity and uh, they certainly use it for all these purposes. But I would like to focus today on one issue and that is the migration to, to the new media use social media. And it's important to know, terrorists never invented anything about the internet. They never promoted our knowledge of the internet or online platforms by any means. But they were very fast and very effective in using the Western platforms to attack the West, as ISIS is doing recently. So everything that you see here is used by the West, even by the way, uh, the virtual reality game of uh, Second Life. But Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitter, and even Google Earth, and I'll show you some examples. So this is an important slide, okay? At last, something is important. Uh, I would argue that there are three stages already in the development of online terrorism. The first one was when they had only websites, <coughs> quite passive, and um, for the customers to come and visit. That was the late 90s and the early 2000s. Then they decided they should need some interactive media, not just sitting there and waiting for the customers to show up. So they added forums and chat rooms and so on, keeping the website, so just an addition. And the third stage that emer just emerged in recent years is adding to the websites and the interactive uh, social, uh, and to the interactive forums and chat rooms, the new social media like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. So the arsenal and the presence online just uh, broadened. And uh, now, and this is another, this is the most important message that I have to say. In order to understand the move to, to the social media, we have to understand that it combines, it correlates with four other new trends in online terrorism. The first one is the idea of virtual interactivity. That is, it, it's not just posting online, we interact. I'll show you how. We talk to you, we seduce you, we radicalize you, we recruit you, we teach you, we argue with you, you can respond. And this is the beauty of the internet, I mean, certainly for the academics, but this is the problem with the internet. They can, for the terrorists, they can, as I show you, create virtual interactivity online. The second one is narrow casting. I'll just explain it very shortly. Uh, instead of one message to all, broadcasting, they use now, which is known as uh, the modern advertising and uh, marketing tactic, narrow casting. That is targeting specific groups with specific messages. Now, it is easier to do with social media. Different messages, different appeals, different contents, and you can craft what you want. Let it be children, let it be women, let it be overseas diaspora communities, and so on. Narrow casting is one. Third is do-it-yourself attempts. Online radicalization, online training, online recruitment. You don't have to come to a training camp. You don't have to join us in the past camps in Libya or Lebanon or Syria or Iraq. You can do it at home. And finally, the emerging trend that's known as escapism, which, as I will argue, it's not the long way. 
there's a virtual text behind it. The, the long verse of Nelson Mandela. We are supported, encouraged, taught, recruited, radicalized, and even launched online. Now, all of these trends combine together into the social media uh, used by terrorists. Some, some example. This was the early Al-Qaeda website. So I spoke about the first stage, only websites, very passive. One language only, Arabic, not very sophisticated, not well protected, but kept alive. It kept alive till 2002. This was actually the last day we, we downloaded it. It was called Anja.com, the call, calling. And it was hacked and then is replaced by numerous websites. But Al-Qaeda is moving to a more sophisticated uh, path. Now we are moving to the more interactive one. Like the Inspire magazine that I'm quite sure that most of you are familiar with it. No, this is a very chicky, glossy, modern, appealing, in English, online magazine with many issues. These are just the cover issues, it's just a, a front pages. And as I will show you, we have evidence that is not just consumed by uh, many followers of the Hadi movement all over the world, but also by some of them who learned how to attack or how to join a terrorist group through Inspire. This is, by the way, the recent one, Inspire 12 from March 2014. And it has like car bombs in America teaching how to launch long reach attacks on terrorists. Why is social media so attractive for terrorists? Interactive, I spoke about it. It's very trendy, very popular, especially among young people who are the target population for recruitment and radicalization. And more than that, it's instead of us waiting in our store for you to come and visit us, we come knocking on your door. Using the social media, we will reach you. We will find you. We will tweet you. We will post on Facebook. We will uh, get some uh, videos that will attract you, like beheadings and so on. We are <coughs> knocking on your door. We are not waiting for you to come. Virtual interactivity, let me give you some examples, the very fast ones. How, how can they use uh, various online media? For it started for with Zawahiri, uh, Al-Qaeda's uh, leader now, who decided one day to have a press conference. Now, how would you have a press conference meeting hundreds of terrorists when there's such a prize on your head? You can't invite them to your cave, right? Well, you have a virtual cave and you do it online. And you publish a call, send me your questions. Took him five months and he published the answers. He chose 100 questions. Press conference online. Send me your questions. Now he's not the only one. Aulaki, remember Aulaki? Um, the preacher, the Yemenite, the American Yemenite. One of the most significant preachers and violent one of Al Qaeda. Send your question to Aulaki. By the way, he's dead, but he's responding. Online, everything is possible. How, how did. Uh, Mr. Hassan said, there are no borders. Well, I guess there are no borders between this world and the second one, <laughs> because he's answering them. Of course it's not him, I guess. It looks like this is very busy with the political dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what question you will send to him, Eitan. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at Inspire magazine, it's not just a magazine. It's opening a chat. How to communicate with us. OK, you read the paper. You're interested. You, want you have some questions. You have some doubts. You even want to criticize us. Well, here is how to communicate. Send a message, and we will answer, and they answer. Uh, so virtual, com um, virtual interactivity is very important online. And um, as you can see, many groups, in this case, Shabab in Somalia, releases answers online. So you can interact, and you can YouTube. YouTube, they tube. Why not? Uh, YouTube is very important for them. It's visual, moving images, colorful, attractive, young populations like to see it, easy to download materials from there to your phone, easy to watch, and uh, you can distribute the content later on DVDs, telephones, CDs, and so on. So who's on YouTube? All of them. There's no way to remove them. Try, put just the word Hamas Islamic Resistance Movement. Don't put just Hamas because then you will be flooded. But if you just put in YouTube search 
as I do, okay? Hamas Islamic resistance mo movement. This combination will have one almost 1,500 videos right now. Most of them propaganda, of course. How about Awlaki? Don't put Awlaki, you'll be swamped, okay? Just put tribute to Anwar al awlaki and you'll end up with 4,580 videos of the dead creature still preaching from heaven. Oh, well, maybe it's not that big to deserve those days. And you can see all of them are there. Nobody can move them, nobody can block them. Uh, Hamas launched even its own YouTube, called it Aksa Tube, later replaced by Pal Tube. And in fact, and I'll go very fast, all terrorist groups today are on YouTube, all of them. And just to give you an example, Hezbollah is there, Al Qaeda is there. Um, the Chechen rebels are there, PKK, the Kurdish underground authority, uh, Taliban, <coughs> trust me. How about Facebook and other social platforms not invented by terrorists, but used by them efficiently? Uh, try Generation Awlaki on Facebook, and you'll find a very chicky, very stylish, and very appealing to Westerners um, postings by uh, Olaki, the other Olaki, of course, by somebody doing it for him. This is the, if you <laughs> want to find him. Uh, the messages are far from being friendly or nonviolent. They are very violent and they are very seductive, the blood of the martyrs and so on. You can download his lectures from Facebook. It's all there. Twitter, those short tweets, used by all terrorist groups, including ISIS. Let's look at, remember, Al-Shabaab attacking the mall. Al-Shabaab, relatively small group, related to Al-Qaeda, somewhat primitive in <coughs> forms of action, uh, attacking the Westgate Mall in Nairobi last year, actually, exactly a year ago. Not really primitive. The world was informed live on the event, on the unfolding event by Shabab. Al Shabab used Twitter and you see the messages. And they just informed the media. All the world media, instead of going there, were fed by the terrorist group using Twitter. With them and you can see the HMS press office, this is the way they had uh, identified themselves. About the hostages, about the number of victims and so on. Al-Qaeda is on Twitter, and of course, all of them. ISIS is posting, uh, we saw the recent uh, executions that were getting so much coverage, maybe because they were Westerners, and maybe because they were staged in a, what I would call the theater of terror production style, with the color of the dress and the victim reading, uh, you know what I mean. But there were many executions long before that online. And some of them were in involved even crucifixion. Muslims crucify other Muslims and posting it online. Uh, in Syria, it's by the way, both sides. Uh, there is the Syrian Electronic Army, SEA, a hackers group uh, used by the Assad regime. And this is the symbol, and they attacked more than once, especially American websites like media and economic websites. This was the time when Obama was considering uh, attacking Assad. Yeah, the new partner now. But at that time, so Assad wanted to, wanted to deter the Americans using uh, cyber attacks. One of them, which I will just show you, was on a Twitter uh, website of AP. This was, look, forget the graph, look just here. Two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. That was a fake uh, news inserted into the AP, Associated Press. A Twitter account, they managed to break in and posted that for a short time, very short. Now look at the graph, what happened at one o'clock that day at the Stock Exchange of America, of the US. Dow Jones dropped down for a short while because people got the message. $136 billion loss by one group hacking into AP. So let me get closer to the end. How about Google Earth? Well, I bet if you were a terrorist now, you will love it. 
This is, I mean, a dream come true. Free satellite services. You don't have to pay, you don't have to register. You can download maps, pictures, and so on. Are they doing it? Of course they do. Remember the attacks on Mumbai, 2008, including the Chabad synagogue and the dead family and the hotels and so on. The terrorists were equipped with cellular phones, downloaded these maps. They knew exactly where they are, how far from the target, how will they get there using Google Earth. There are many examples, and I'll just skip some of them, downloaded from terrorist websites, from terrorist attacks, from maps, even the uh, Hamas in Gaza Strip, one of the operatives. We obtained the details from Google Earth, and he's looking at the satellite service of Sderot, one of the targets. This is what he's looking at. <laughs> Believe it or not, even the CIA uh, picture headquarters in Langley, Virginia, are posted on jihadi websites. And finally, lone wolves. Let me argue, as I said before, there are no lone wolves. I studied lone wolves in nature. Lone wolves cannot survive. They die in nature. They hunt in packs. A lone wolf cannot survive. The same about terrorism. We see a lone wolf, but behind him, there is a pack. We don't see the pack because the pack is usually a virtual one. So we have virtual packs of lone wolves. If you're interested, one of my recent publication is the virtual packs of lone wolves published just last year by the Woodrow Wilson Center. And uh, I'll skip some of these uh, um, quotes, but it is certainly an emerging uh, trend. And we have many cases of uh, lone wolves attack, people who seem to be act acting by themselves, all of these, in Europe, in Canada, in USA, and other places, England. But they are not alone. They are radicalized, recruited, taught, and launched online. Uh, if you look at Inspire magazine, you'll see I'm a proud to be a traitor to America, call for calling the lone wolves. Um, we have many other examples on using, um, uh, like this one, online calls for them. And you have the Boston Marathon attack, if you remember, April 2013. These were the two brothers, right? The Tsarnev brothers. They were not members of a group. They were, didn't go to the camp. How did they know how to build a bomb? I don't know. They knew. They visited Inspire magazine and downloaded this page. By the way, I blackened it, so you won't get the idea how to use Persian cooking. <laughs> but it's possible. Okay, so there is a way to do it, and they learn from there. We know because they downloaded the page to their computers, and they did exactly according to the instructions from open source jihad online. So the lone wolves are being called and recruited online, being radicalized and being taught online, and even launched. And there is even, if you're interested, an online booklet, non mujahideen mujahid pocket book. And once you do it, you're even glorified. And there are online uh, memorial walls for those lone wolves, including the recent one uh, for one of the dead, the dead son of brother. You can see him in sky. Well, no virgins, but I mean, the message is quite clear that he's quite happy where he is now. <laughs> so uh, there are many cases, and uh, there are many lone wolves associated uh, with the possession of Inspire and so on. Finally, geez, this is interesting. If you look at the lone wolves and you map the connections they had online, almost all of them go to one person, the dead Anwar al -Awaki. They go to his website, they download his material, they communicate with him online. All the roads lead to one person. So finally, what can we do about it? Three measures, these are my last two minutes, Eitan. I think that we should recognize that the social media is a new arena and we need to fight a new type of war, new warriors, new weapons, and new defenses. It requires new regulations, but we have to be very careful how to balance national security with civil liberties. What is the golden balance between them? How can we minimize the damage to our national security without 
paying heavier prices, uh, too heavy prices, in terms of freedom of press, flow of communication, and so on. And finally, and this is maybe the most important message I have to say, so far what we are doing is like a cat and a mouse. They do something, we react to them, they react to what we do, and it's like a cat and mouse. I think that we should be preemptive, and we can actually make some predictions about the future. Not to wait for them to use Facebook and say, okay, they are using Facebook, what shall we do? But we can also predict what will be the next Facebook, the next Twitter, the next YouTube. And how can we construct the new, new platforms so that they won't be able to use and abuse them? So how to do that? Well, in two months, my new book, uh, <laughs> Terrorist, Terrorism in Cyberspace, The Next Generation, this is the title published by Columbia University Press, will give you about 300 pages of answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gabi. And I want to call the next speaker, is uh, Gabriel Mazuz, please. First of all, it is an uh, honor to speak after uh, Professor uh, Gabi. Microphone, microphone, thank you. I said it is an honor to speak uh, after uh, Professor uh, Gabi. Uh, it is a difficult uh, act to follow his presentation, but my presentation is uh, totally different. I'm going to talk about something else. But uh, the happy thing is I have only 10 slides, so relax. The, the subject is the next threat. <coughs> My presentation is divided to three parts. The first part, I will talk about a typical cyber, de cyber defense. Actually, most of the people here uh, know about uh, the, the cyber defense. After that, I will talk about the, the, new, uh, the new trait, the uh, hardware uh, Trojan, and uh, I will finish with some uh, conclusions. Typical cyber uh, defense concept includes uh, a lot of uh, entities and uh, I would like to, uh, to focus on some of them. First of all, when you talk about a uh, uh, cyber defense concept, uh, we talk about uh, hardware, about uh, software, about tools, about packages, uh, methodology, human resource, and uh, uh, for sure about the intelligence. Intelligence is uh, very important uh, today, and you can get intelligence from a lot of uh, sources. When I buy a system for my company, and I'm talking about general company, not just about uh, my company specific, you have to show today that uh, in the system, you got also you get also a, a security package, and when I talk about security package, I talk about everything. What I mean, everything. The hardware is um, is uh, include security issues, software. Uh, policy, and when I talk about that, it's not easy, because when you buy a, a machine that's going to cost something like five million dollars, you will not believe that sometimes, or most of the time, 
they don't take care for the security issue because they said security, it's not so important. The people here understand how much security is important, but when a, a supplier uh, build a new machine, he, he doesn't take care for this in the beginning. But just in the last year, they can understand that uh, security is very important. I love here some things. First of all, training. Our people, because you know that most of the machines, they don't have uh, uh, security tools, we, t we have a uh, cyber gym uh, arena training and you take all our people to, to have uh, a cyber uh, training there. The other thing is drills. At least once a year, we must take a drill to all the company and to exercise the people with cyber uh, actions. Okay. Is it enough to end the future tracks? This is good. What I, sh what I showed about the cyber defense concept is very good, but it is enough for today. It is good for the new threats. Is implementation of cyber defense concept enough to ward off future threats? What do you think? No, no, no. But you know, a year ago, when I asked this question, the answer was exactly positive. It's enough. How much it cost to, to do this difference? Million of dollars. And you say it's not enough. So what should you do? I'm going to talk about hardware trojans. This is something new. This is something that right now we, we do a lot of research in CyberGym to understand the meaning of the hardware trojans. It's not simple. Hardware trojan, by definition, is adding extra circuits. How is your telephone? Do you think it's clean? Maybe, oops. In general, a hardware trojan is defined as any international alteration to a design. We get a machine and we know what I write to get from the designer, but I don't know what exactly I get in my factory. In order to alter its characteristics. The Trojan may affect circuit AC parameters, such as uh, delay and power, can cause malfunction under rare condition and other. It's, it's very, very a uh, problem because even when I see this formula, maybe most of them don't understand what is it, but with hardware Trojan, I can change everything. And nobody can know what's going on. This is not something in software. This is something with hardware and software together. When I talk about a Trojan, hardware Trojan, I can divide it into three parts. The first part, is the physical, 
the second part is the activation and the third part is the action. Today, I'm going to emphasize only the physical. And when I talk about other trojans, I'm, I want to impact the layout of the machine. I would like to impact the sensors, but nobody knows how can I do it. When I get a machine, I get machine with a main circuit. But I don't know if there may be a kind of bump which is undetectable, but can be triggered at a certain time in the future. Like we have a lot of resistance, a lot of transistors, a lot of uh, uh, electronic uh, equipment, but maybe they have something more. Trojan circuit that one day it, uh, it's triggered and it do something. Example. We see here a circle. But in this circle, they have thousands of uh, enti el electronic entities. And one, one that is not from the designer. One, it's something new. And this one can change everything. For example, we can change the voltage of the machine. And the user, the, the operator, cannot r see it, but only the sensor can understand what's going on. Another example, in electricity, very, very important is the amplitude of the signal, of the signal. And through the hardware trojan, I can change a little bit the amplitude, and with that, I can change all the signals in the machine. Cyber attack are a matter of imagination and solutions are very difficult to find. Solution for hardware trades are our next challenge. Because right now, really, we don't know how to find it. We know the problem. We know it can be done, but we don't know how to find it. The conclusions, when you buy a system, first of all, do all that is required to ensure cyber defense. Like, look at all the typical uh, defense cyber concept, check everything and you see that everything is okay. But after that, it is wise to think outside of the box for unexpected threats. Today I gave only one example about, uh, about uh, hardware trojans, but they have more than that threats that I, don't, I, don't, I didn't want to talk about them today, that uh, we know they are uh, there, we know that we don't know how to, to, to check them, how to know about them, and we have to be ready that uh, some day something will happen and you have to take care about that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And now please, uh, Rami Fati. Good morning, everybody. I don't have slides. Uh, that's because I would like you to ask as many questions as you would like to have, uh, if we'll have the time to do it. Uh, first of all, I'm very proud and uh, honored to be here today with you, Dr. Azani, and with ICT. I'm a member of the ICT uh, organization, and uh, I think that this... Uh, M ICT Empire. You're from China? 
<laughs> in Chinese they say, man man lai. Okay. Slowly, slowly. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to speak today is about the uh, national level. And I'm very proud that I heard uh, Professor Gabi Weinman's uh, presentation because I didn't plan to speak about social media, but I'll speak a little bit and uh, mention what happened also uh, during uh, Protective uh, Edge, which we call it in Hebrew Tsukaitan, uh, with the social media. And the only uh, unslide that I'm going to read for you is something that I uh, was looking this morning in the uh, Wikipedia about what is really terrorism. I think it's very important to understand it because that's the way we are going to deal with terrorism and that the way that we are dealing with terrorism. The modern defi definition of terrorism refers to criminal or illegal acts of violence at randomly chosen targets in an effort to raise fear. It is practiced by extremist groups Terror, on the other hand, is practiced by governments and law enforcement officials, usually within the legal framework of work. It means that let's see and look what in the national level do we have to do and what do we have to do in the international level. Uh, one of my followers today is uh, Mr. Ido Moed from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, one of the most important partners in dealing with, anti with cyber anti-terrorism and that's why I'm so proud to see also many uh, friends of mine from Canada, from Italy, from other places, because one of the main ways to deal with terrorism is to cooperate. And let's start with cooperation. What is a cooperation? A cooperation starts mainly, first of all, internally. Let's see who is in charge in Israel about the national security for cyber, and how do they deal together also with terror? In Israel, uh, according to the uh, Israeli decision, we have some groups, we call themselves the special groups. You can find them all over. I'm not going to uh, say any secret thing today. The most uh, uh, well-known are, of course, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, which is in charge of the IDF security. The second one is the Ministry of Defense, which is in charge of the Ministry of Defense and all the industrial, uh, uh, all the industries. The third one, of course, are the intelligence organization. The Shin Bet, which takes one of the most important role in dealing with terror and with cyber, and made a big change during the last years dealing with uh, cyber. The second one is the Mossad and the Israeli intelligence. All of them are dealing, each one is dealing with responsible for their cyber. Of course, the police and when we are speaking about cyber terror and finance, we speak about the police as well. And what happened during the last three years? Suddenly we found that there is one very important group which is not being taken as a very important part, and this is the civilian group. Nobody was dealing with the civilians, with you, with you, with my aunt in Hadera, I don't have an aunt in Hadera, <laughs> and uh, with uh, the supermarket, and uh, when we started to speak about cyber as a terror activities, first of all, we started to listen and learn about organizations like IEC, electrical companies all over the world, uh, energies and others, and most of them not in Israel. Uh, when you came to the CEOs and you told them, we have to take all the precautions against cyber attack, they said to you usually, it will never happen to us. And unfortunately, even today, in many places, each one understands that there is a risk about cyber attacks on energy, communication, um, healthcare, transportation. These are the new buzzwords <coughs> that I'm going to deal with them on cyber. But most of the organization that you are coming to speak with them, when they start to identify that you are talking about a big amount of money, <coughs> they say it will never happen to us. And that's why the big change was done during or by the SEC, the USU SEC and others. They said, listen, all the directors of these big companies, you are responsible. This was one of the first uh, thing happened. 
And uh, I'm not going to speak about myself. I'm a serious entrepreneur. I just started a new startup dealing with cybersecurity for critical infrastructure, mainly machine to machine and SCADA. Why? Because I believe that this part is undercover, meaning the attackers are trying to do older cyber attacks. Fortunately, mainly in Israel, they didn't succeed. They didn't succeed because in Israel, something happened. It happened in 2002. In 2002, the government of the state of Israel decided to establish a new organization. They called this organization NISA, National Information Security Agency. And they put NISA under the well-known organization dealing with terror and anti-terror, which is the Israeli Shin Bet, the Israeli Internal Security Agency. And this agency, and this was very unique, more than 10 years ago, decided that they will identify, first of all, what is critical infrastructure. And they identified critical infrastructure not as every power company, not as every ISP, not as every uh, communication center. They established a group that identified not more than 30 companies to be identified as critical infrastructure. And the government of the state of Israel decided to do something else. They decided also that this group, the NISA group or the Shin Bet, is going to act as a regulator. Acting as a regulator means that they can force or enforce whatever they decide to, to make sure that the cyber attack will not take place. And luckily from 2002, not that I'm going to uh, come out with any uh, big news, but luckily, in Israel, we also say sometimes, thanks God. Uh, we are working well due to uh, uh, Gabi Mazuz and these guys who are investing a lot of money. Nobody likes regulators. Nobody would like the regulators, the regulators to do the work, especially because it costs a lot of money. But this brought us to the most important part, saying, OK, we are securing it. And now let's look at the other parts. I heard today uh, Gabby Weinman's uh, presentation, which was really great, Gabby. I didn't know you before, and I'm, I'm very impressed. There is one thing that I'm very, very concerned about it, and you should be as well. What I believe is that the terrorists are using new kinds of methods that we are not yet aware about them, and they are using our need, our wish to know what they are doing in the Al-Qaeda website, in the uh, Hamas website, and in the other, to use it against us in a way which is still, still on a stealth mode that we cannot identify. And I'll give you an example. I believe that one of the uh, ways to make sure that we will all be somehow infected and affected badly by the terrorist organization is by using our websites or by searching into their website in order to download viruses and Trojan horses that we don't even know that they are existing. Meaning the new kind of threats, now everybody knows the name, it's APT, Advanced Persistent Threats. If you are downloading, if you're looking at one of these websites, Maybe you are being affected, and maybe you are going to affect all your friends. <coughs> Second, one of the most well-known ways done by a terrorist organization, also during uh, Protective Edge, also during what we used to call Ops USA, the biggest attack on the US banks by Ezadin El Qassam group, was to use a kind of attack which is very simple called DDoS, distributed denial of service. I'm sure that all of you heard about it. Just to give an, a very quick uh, sample, let's imagine that I have one ball, ball. I push it to uh, Nir. Nir is still able to get it. Two ball. Oh, it's not so easy. Three balls. Well, he's a very talented guy. He can get it. Twenty. He cannot do it. It means 
whenever 20 servers, or let's say 20,000 servers, are starting to attack a bank, as a matter of fact, almost nothing happens to the bank unless on the psychological warfare effect. But my aunt in Hadera, the one that I told you already, she started to say her uh, husband, Shmil, listen, I'm a little bit concerned about the Lumi or any other bank that I'm uh, a member because I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, somehow connect to the banks via the internet. Maybe we'll go to the floor downstairs and took the money that we uh, left there several years ago. And most of the guys and most of the attacks also happened on Protective Shields, Ops USA, Ops Gaza, Ops Israel, which is an annual Memorial Day that they are using it, started to be a DDoS attack, which I'm going to speak about it because this was done a lot by terrorists as well. I'm coming from many years of experience in cyber and as I told you about the websites that I'm concerned, I'm concerned that some of these DDoS attacks that after two days or three days or 20 days or 40 days we say, okay, as a matter of fact, it affected us a little bit only, but nothing happened, all the banks are okay. As a matter of fact, I'm really concerned that these DDoS attacks are being used as a deception to go inside these uh, um, organizations and inject a kind of script, a Trojan horse, whatever that is waiting for the day that <coughs> it will be called to action. Meaning we all understand that all over our computers, our uh, mobile phones, everything is affected. If you don't know it, just look at your emails <coughs> and you will see one email coming from Dr. Eitan Azani and this email says, listen guys, I'm your friend, I'm so sorry, I'm in Thailand, somebody <laughs> took my wallet <laughs> and uh, unfortunately I need only five dollars to come back. Did you get such an email? <laughs> if you got it, it means that you are affected. <laughs> and of course, like Israelis, we say, he's a good friend and we are all friends. But you know, five dollars to eight and a zani. Yeah, what, hap zani. what happened? Right what happened? Yeah. What happened? Well, and and those and those who are doing it, they are doing it uh, uh, in a way that somebody else is getting it. So, the government of the state of Israel identified two main organizations to deal with the cyber. I say main, but they are not the only ones. The first one dealing with anti-terror is the Israeli Shin Bet, due or by using uh, NISA as its very important arm to do it, and they are in charge for the critical infrastructure. The second one, which was established exactly on January 1st, 2012, and I had the honor to be with the people who started it and had the, uh, the division of the civilian uh, groups, is the, inter uh, the Israeli National Cyber Bureau. Israeli Cyber Bureau is not an acting group, it is a coordinating group. And these two organizations, together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which takes a very important role in coordinating all the international efforts, are working together in order to make sure that Israel will be much more secured. I promised you one minute only about uh, Protective Edge, I can speak about it uh, much more but just to let you know what really happened. Every political issue happens in Israel, brings all the bad guys together to start an attacking. It can be on a regular day anonymous, which decides to do it. On the other day, it can be some terrorist groups who try also to coordinate. This brings us to a question that I'm not going to elaborate in such a short time who is in charge of the intelligence to deal with cyber attacks? Is it still only the Mossad, the Shin Bet, the CIA, the NSA, all the other intelligence organizations, or, or, or is there any other ways to do it? I can tell you that today, most of the information about cyber attacks is coming from open source intelligence, something that I'm not going to elaborate now, but it gives us a hope, a hope that we can do it much better. But just to summarize 
what I wanted to send as a message, we have to deal with cyber attacks as if it is a terrorist attacks, and terrorist attacks can be stopped only, if you will, first of all, invest a lot of money, if we will identify the exact groups who are going to do it, if we will make the right regulations, if we will deal with international regulations and collaboration with all over the world, and the last word, if we will come out with new opportunity, which we call the cyber industry, and uh, proudly, I have to make some promotion as well, I'm leading for the second year the uh, Cybertech 2015 on March 17, that more than 10,000 people came, and you can see in one place more than 300 or 400 companies all over the world coming to Israel, startups and uh, well-established companies to see what they can do together in order to come out with new solutions to the threat that was uh, shown to us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frati. And now uh, we we'll listen to uh, Devora from the international point of view. Thanks, uh, Ethan. Can we forego the mic? Can we forego the mic? It's not working. No, no, no. No, no, no. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Good to see everybody here. Um, I've also had the honor, uh, as Rami has, of being associated with this, with IDC for a while, ICT for a while. And I don't know, Eitan, about, I think it's your empire in progress for sure, but conveners of uh, hardcore thinking and <coughs> high level sophisticated conferences such as this one, you're already a judge. So th thank you, thank you for that. So let's get a little exercise. We've been sitting for a while. It's, it's going to be exercise that involves raising your hands. So how many people in this room are computer programmers or hackers? Okay, so we have one person. That's great. How many people deal in one way or another with cyber policy, cybersecurity? Okay, a few more. And now the, really, the real question, is how many lawyers in the room? Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God. Okay. So um, it's even more of a pleasure to uh, be here in front of you today. I'm an international lawyer. Pardon me? Not really. So you see, the lawyers are less willing to admit their profession than the hackers are. That's a problem. Um, so we've been looking at cyber terrorism closely for about a decade. And I think what's most interesting to, to me as an international lawyer who's looking at the evolution of international norms and, and mechanisms of enforcement is the phenomenon that's pretty, um, pr pretty without precedent in international, pretty much without precedent in international law, of a gap between the really harrowing scenarios, some of which we've seen today in the presentations um, uh, bef before mine, um, which, which, is, which is really scary, harrowing, how do we prepare for these events? And on the other hand, a real lack of hard physical world damage done by terrorists using the internet. And that's a distinction, t distinction that we're going to look at. Um, there's even one, <coughs> someone uh, uh, who, who can be quoted as uh, saying that if you, I read a quote somewhere that says if you look on the, in Google and, uh, for virtual cyber attacks, you'll find 30,000 articles, but you won't find one event. So we're going to look at that a little bit today from the point of view of international law. Everyone can hear me okay? Even the recording people? Okay. Um, let's take a look right away at two examples of events that have been called cyber terrorism. How are we doing? Wait a minute. So this is our difference. Two events. Um, I'm going to use your event, Gabby, if that's okay. Uh, two events that have been called cyber terrorism. And keep in mind the question as you're looking at these um, brief slides about how you think about terrorist terrorist acts and whether these events really are terrorist acts. So example one we've already seen. Thanks for the intro. Um, President Obama came to Israel in March 2013. We protected him as we normally do, normally protect other heads of states. We brought out the police, we had blockades, we did good checking, we returned the president safely home. And then the next month, as we've already seen, a uh, Twitter account is attacked, the AP Twitter account, two explosions in the White House, Barack Obama is injured. So he's virtually been attacked, we <coughs> saw the effect. Same slide. Um, this was called, fairly universally, a cyber terrorist attack. Let's think about whether it is. Example number two, the Saudi hacker in 2012. Those of you who are Israelis will remember this. Um, 
Ox Omar was the name given to the Saudi hacker that he gave himself. 15,000 Israelis had their credit card data hacked and published on the web. Now, the Bank of Israel said the credit card companies are responsible for taking care of any damage caused by this attack, which was very reassuring. But the public debate was so stormy. Um, I attended the Knesset <coughs> session, which was convened, I think, within two days, unprecedented for an internet subject, to discuss what really, what are the outcomes? What do we do about this sort of terrorism? Why did we even call this terrorism? <coughs> because Oxomer himself, the, ha the Saudi hacker, said, this is a terrorist attack on Israel. I want to hurt Israel politically, economically, and culturally. I'm a virtual <laughs> terrorist. He passed away from an accident, I believe. He passed away from? An accident, like about two months later. So you were following up on his health <laughs> and well-being. <laughs> Rami, I, I know there's a reason I trust you a lot. Now I have real hard evidence. Um, <coughs> so these are two events. When we take a look at, when we analyze these two examples, how do we know we're looking at cyber terrorism? How do we know how to call this a terrorist attack? And more than that, wha what do international lawyers and international legal regimes do in order to cope with situations like this? So I'm going to argue that for a change, this is a little bit in contrast to people who've come before me today, international lawyers are a little bit ahead of the curve on this. Very unusual for us. Usually the lawyers um, and the military thinkers are, you're, you're smiling so you know, we're usually taking care of the legal norms that will be, be effective for the war that just happened or the events that just happened. <coughs> and here we're a little bit ahead of the curve. And I'm going to argue that the reason that we're ahead of the curve um, is based on really two elements. Element number one, decision makers are scared. Um, they've seen the potential damage. They've seen what the threat looks like. And they're already in a situation, I'm talking about militarists, I'm talking about uh, political decision makers and international lawyers, are in, already past the, the curve or past the hump of understanding that this is a problem. So the anticipation of real world terrorist attacks, and I would argue that so far we've only seen virtual world cyber attacks with little real damage, um, has put everybody in a thinking mode, number one, of we need to anticipate this. And this is, we've heard this a little bit before from <coughs> the other speakers. <coughs> Point number two is that the lawyers are on this. And we're going to take a look at some of the international regimes that have uh, delved in a little bit and taken responsibility for both norm, uh, result, uh, forming norms that are going to be applicable to cyber terror and enforcement regimes. So let's dive in. This is. Um, not a comprehensive view of the international efforts to deal with cyber terror, but a few sort of prime examples. And I know Ido is going to give more texture to some of them. So just a quick, a quick survey. Uh, convention on Cybercrime, which, was the only, which is the only convention um, that's ever been concluded in the area of I I to, to apply to cyberspace. It's an early one in 2001. Um, I have my own explanation of why this cybercrime convention came on so early um, and, and why so many states, about 40 states now, are parties to this convention. Israel is <coughs> in the process of signing on to it. Uh, this early formation of norms against cybercrime, not cyber terror specifically, but cybercrime, was because of the financial threat. So mostly European countries, this is a European initiative, European countries said we are already in 2001 losing so much money to cybercrime, gambling, online prostitution, et cetera. We've got to do something about it. <coughs> so this is, that's been a success. Why are we including it in the circle around cyber terror? Because cyber terror is a kind of cybercrime. My view, short version, is that this, uh, this convention is completely applicable to terror as well as cybercrime. That's another lecture for another day. Uh, example two, which we'll go into a little bit <coughs> detail on, is uh, the European Community's Clean It initiative. Has anyone heard of that? Very controversial. Clean IT, clean it. Um, we'll look at in a second. Uh, controversial because of the damage that it ostensibly does to privacy rights. We'll take a look. We're going to start out, uh, Ito is going to go into much more detail about the GGE, but we're going to take a look first of all at the NATO effort. Uh, anyone heard of the Talon Manual in this room? Okay, good. Uh, this is an important, important to remember. We're going to start with this. The Talon Manual, you're going to see it's Rule 36, which defines what cyber 
attacks, uh, cyber terror is, the first serious effort of international lawyers to sit in a room and say, how do the laws of war and the laws that we have around terror apply in cyberspace? Now, it's not a binding document. It's a uh, collection of some very wise minds thinking of how we take the laws of war that are applied traditionally in international law and move them into this new space. Uh, lots of effort, three years of effort under NATO's aegis went into this. It uh, was published last year, available easily online. And it's now become really the, 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 point of, the point of contact from which the rest of the legal processes internationally are going to develop. So just to sort of put a question mark and an exclamation point here, this is the first time that anyone has really said what cyber terror is. Again, remember, not a binding rule, but look how concise it is. It's general. I'm not sure how much we learn from the norm, but what this really signifies, Rule 36, is that legal minds have moved from laws of war applying in the real world to laws of war applying in cyberspace. So cyber attacks or the threat thereof, the primary purpose <coughs> of which is to spread terror among the civilian population. We can argue with the definition, but there it is. Now, what's a cyber attack? Rule 30, just to fill in the blank here. A cyber attack is a cyber operation, whether offensive or defensive, that is reasonably expected to cause injury or death to persons or damage or destruction to objects. Note for yourselves, this is physical world, right? Big question mark, because remember the two examples we looked at at the beginning? The damage was virtual, one could argue. Here we're talking already about physical impact in the real world. So that's a question mark and an exclamation point. Um, a word on the Clean IT Project. So again, this is a European initiative. It happens around the same time as the Talon Project. Um, you can see sort of the outline of the principles that um, have, as I said, were controversial because it's really an effort. It's interesting that uh, the, this, the websites and the, and the Facebook, the social media that we were just shown um, in such an interesting way um, raise the eye, or obviously, and, the, and the, um, the awareness that some something needs to be done within the European community. And the response was this, or one of the responses was this. <coughs> so they said, let's have a voluntary arrangement whereby ISPs and even individuals who want to police the internet on behalf of, uh, in order to counteract terrorist activity, have a place to go. So we'll have websites with a police push button. If you think this is a terrorist site, here's a button to click on your browser to alert the police. Here's a hotline for the European police forces uh, to know what's happening on the, on the internet. Um, sounds like a great idea, right? We just saw uh, how, how scary some of this stuff is. Well, it hasn't launched, dead in the water, uh, because of privacy concerns and because of the real exposure that European NGOs and private citizens have said, you know, we, we don't want to be involved in this government terrorist battle on the internet. But note that it's an interesting development. Uh, it may have come before its time. It's something to follow. <coughs> um, <coughs> the next two slides, and Ethan, I have three you more. Have, uh, you have. Thanks. Um, this is a, a, a analysis, really, uh, done by Joseph Knight from the Harvard Kennedy School of what the international regime for dealing with cyber terrorism uh, as a subset of cyber crime looks like today. Now this is a work of genius because he's the first person who said, you know, let's really look at this as a inter an international challenge which is being coped with, this being cyber terror, cyber crime, being coped with at an, on a number of levels by many international organizations. He does the real expert on this, so I'm just gonna treat this quickly, but look at the, Look how Joseph Nye has put together the areas of influence that international organizations, and each one of them has a legal bureau and international lawyers that, that are doing the work of forming principles and norms. Who wants a piece of the action here? Who cares enough about cyber terrorism and cyber crime to put resources and mechanisms into place to deal with it? <coughs> and I did, uh, so this is interesting, you can find this on the web, it's quite, it's, it's available, it's widespread, and it's a great piece of work. Um, what I did was sort of go through and say, which of these bodies, these international bodies or, or legal efforts <coughs> really focus in not only on cyber crime, but on cyber terror? 
So as you can see my, by the red circles I've put here, um, it's not everybody. But as I said uh, a few minutes ago, we're really sort of in the middle of a process um, where the UN is getting engaged. Um, the law of war, <coughs> the law of war <coughs> institutions are getting engaged. The Five Eyes in the intelligence community is getting engaged with cyber terror. The Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, Interpol, are getting engaged on specifically forming norms and principles and enforcement mechanisms to do something about cyber terror. Um, I'm, I'm willing to bet that if we do the same conference in another year and we come back, this slide is going to be filled with a lot more red circles. Um, just briefly, I'll mention, because of con time considerations, Israel is also within its Domestic legislation <coughs> trying to take care of, uh, of terror, as many of you probably know, with a new definition of what an act of terror is. We haven't specifically gone into what terrorist, uh, cyber terror is uh, uh, in a way that satisfies my sort of lawyerly insistence on defining the thing. But what you see here in brackets, the serious harm to vital, vital infrastructures piece, is the current definition in uh, the, uh, the draft bill under, on this Knesset's table right now to deal with new forms of terror. So if you take a careful look and think back to the two examples we had at the beginning, you can see that there's a really broad sense in dealing with terror in general that um, breaches of databases, uh, harm that's <coughs> caused via the internet but into the real world um, is covered by this. And I know that the legislators have been thinking about whether cyber terror fits into this sort of general umbrella of serious damage, for example, to the country's economy or environment? The answer is probably yes. So that's also sort of a more, uh, more domestic Israeli, uh, somewhat vague but probably appropriate way, of appropriate way of dealing with cyber terror. To wrap up, we've looked at terror as a, as a phenomenon that has sort of these three characteristics. You've heard this over and over during this conference. The principles and norms that are being developed. Um, the happening, the pace is, mo is faster than what I would have expected, but slower than perhaps others who are really on the ground and dealing with cyber terror would like. <coughs> uh, finally, as many of us, many of the people on the panel have said before me, we're looking at unanticipated types of cyber terror. We're looking at a very complex threat environment. The principles and norms are evol evol evolving. Enforcement mechanisms are where you want to keep your attention we can have as many norms and principles as we want written down in nice legal documents until the enforcement pieces kick in. That's something that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, we haven't moved forward in the way that's, import that's most important. So the real question is impact. Uh, we need to be very aware as international lawyers that we have, we're responsible for the definitional piece, the normative piece, making sure that uh, when the law enforcers do their work, they have the backing of the legal systems, but the real question is who's doing the work on the ground in order to bring cyber terrorists to justice. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Deb. Uh, Ido, please uh, come to take your seat. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're still uh, keeping up with all these uh, slides and uh, talks. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, Eitan, for having me. Um, I just introduced myself, first of all, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm within the uh, Department for Strategic Affairs. And about a year ago, we recognized the fact that we need a focal point for cyber issues. Uh, being part of other issues that we deal uh, with at our division, which is uh, non-proliferation, uh, regional security, counterterrorism, and so on. So the relationship to cyber and terrorism is very clear in this regard. And basically, it's a new position. And as was mentioned before, uh, policy on cyber is, is evolving, is developing, uh, very much like uh, technology and the understanding, global understanding of what the threats are in terms of uh, cyber. So is it a new dimension? Uh, basically, our um, um, position towards cyber security is that we need to secure free and safe communication globally. That's 
that's our choice. That is what we, we, we believe that uh, the networks that are part of the cyber world and the computers and the users uh, should have. We should provide security so that economic, social, political development can take place. Um, and I chose to use um, this, this definition, which I thought came from uh, Deb House in Korea, but she denies that. I think that um, it's, it's a thought. What, what I'm talking about here, just for the uh, sake of uh, clarity, is there are some thoughts that we are having, developing uh, at the ministry. It's not in terms of policy. So this is not an official definition, but I like this definition very much because it discusses uh, global terrorism and mainly because it discusses the issue of tools. And the tools are, of course, the content, the information, or uh, the hardware that was mentioned here earlier, and the software, of course, that flows through uh, the channels. So these three, uh, these three components, I think, in our view, make a distinction between what we call conventional terrorism and cyber terrorism, because we need to focus on cyber uh, uh, terrorism although it's still unclear in what respect. And I'm going to talk about that, and Deb mentioned some international organizations work that, that understands that, but still it's evolving. So we are focusing on tools. And um, first of all, the question that was also mentioned here, I think before, uh, a hacktivist and a terrorist, are they the same? What's the difference? Is there a difference? Is it important to make a difference? That's a question that is very important in our context, but I'm not going to dwell on that further. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, as far as tools, uh, there are a few things that are, that, are, that are important to note. First of all, it's the intent is there, of course, and the outcome is, is provable. You know that something happened, whether it's kinetic or it's cyber related, something happened, something changed. I mean, that's the whole issue for terrorists. Uh, we know what we know, so we know uh, the technologies that are used uh, for terrorism, so perhaps that can lead us to trace back uh, what was the source. And uh, we know about state capabilities, and that's important, I'll discuss that later, because we are talking about known state actors, but we'll, we'll go back to that. And I think that in that respect, it's also easier to agree politically about countermeasures. If we know what's the technology and where it's coming from, perhaps it's easier for us to uh, react as countries um, on what we do. So here are uh, a few issues that um, I want to present to you when the color distinguishes the red distinguishes what is, in my mind, more cyber-related. <laughs> Blue is conventional. And uh, let's have a look at that. So the intent is clear. S terrorists have a very clear intent. We know that. Uh, there is no dispute about that. About capacity, there's a big question marks, uh, several question marks. But the experts say, at least, that at the moment, uh, terrorist organizations still don't have enough capacity to uh, create real damage. But as we noticed already from previous examples, uh, it still can be serious if a Dow Jones uh, falls. Uh, abruptly, or, or of course, when people are hurt, things things happen. Um, the question is regarding weaknesses. Weaknesses. Cyber is all about uh, um, finding, discovering weaknesses in programs, in security, um, to exploit them and to to create damage. So that is very very clear. And of course, also the issue of critical infrastructures. The CI is for critical infrastructures. And you had the you heard here earlier the Israel Electricity Company. Uh, which is considered a critical infrastructure for the f normal functioning of the economy of a country, <coughs> and terrorists would aim to, to uh, create damage there. Uh, what's traditional, of course, is public opinion. Um, terrorists need to reach the wide public. It's part of the definitions that you heard here before. Uh, terrorist organizations, uh, but also criminals, are out there, and it's very hard to distinguish between those two, and sometimes they are the same. Sometimes terrorist organizations, of course, uh, behave as criminals to, um, uh, to, to get money, to get information, and so on. But what's important here is um, that the non-state actors are very difficult to identify. When we're talking about capacity, there are uh, terrorist organizations that in some way or another are supported by state actors. And in that case, a terrorist organization operates on a very different level than what we would consider the capability of a so-called normal uh, terrorist organization. And then, of course, the outcome is either kinetic, meaning um, 
using conventional weapons, people getting hurt in the streets, bombings and so on, or cyber related, <coughs> which means hurting uh, software for uh, uh, software or hardware uh, in any kind of way. So let's talk about Israel. Uh, you'll see a list of terrorist organizations on the right, on the left, which is uh, a list that includes several known terrorist organizations and less known, meaning they are conventional and they are cyber related, like the Syrian Electronic Army. Uh, these are terrorist organizations that operate only in cyber domain. And that's going back to the previous <coughs> slide. And on the right-hand side, you will see that there are also different kinds of operations, different kinds of uh, terrorist actions. So Op Israel is a repeated attack against Israeli infrastructure, uh, critical or not, banks, private people, companies, and so on, that takes place every now and then on specific moments and is... Uh, is, can be noticed through the social media, the, the instigation, the, the push to, uh, t they, they pick a date, like 7th of April, I believe, the recent one was, other dates, uh, to use an attack because they want to create a massive effect of Israeli targets being uh, uh, hit. And protective edge, which uh, Rami Efrati uh, mentioned earlier, uh, which, is, which was a military operation that took place just now in the south, uh, in the Gaza Strip, and during that operation, also a very significant rise in attacks took place in Israel, uh, which was initiated by terrorist organizations. So, as I mentioned, there is this cybercrime, cyber terrorism interrelation, and these three uh, circles basically uh, point to several important factors that we have to consider. First of all, the Budapest Convention, which uh, Deb mentioned earlier, is the only international convention on cybercrime widely accepted in the West. Um, uh, Non-aligned movement countries like Russia and China uh, have a hard time agreeing to it, but it puts down a very clear bottom <coughs> line of cooperation between uh, countries in terms of uh, combating cybercrime. And since cybercrime and cyberterrorism are interrelated, that's a very important tool, but it's only uh, restricted to the area of, of uh, Council of Europe, and I think the United States and Japan are also member of it, and Israel is very soon to exceed. Uh, then we have a national security establishment, and I think uh, Rami Frati discussed that as well. It's evolving. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, system in each and every country around the world. Who runs cybersecurity? Who is responsible for the national cyber defense? It's a territory that is still not well defined. The cooperation systems are complex. Uh, in each and every country, you would find all kinds of um, ideas, putting together people from different organizations or creating new organizations. But that's where non-state actors have a sort of a vacuum to operate because it's not very clear who is responsible for what. Is this just police? Is this military? Uh, and so on. And the technology. The technology which is the important drive for the development of, of uh, high technology which is important for the global economy, for um, global development. But the technology is of course being abused and there it's, it's extremely hard to find ways to manage the flow of influence, the proliferation of, uh, let's say, positive, uh, benign technology into the domain of cybercrime and cyber uh, terrorism. And that's a huge challenge. So there is a sort of a balance that we're trying to strike, I think, between the existing remedies, the, the infrastructure, the politi political, the national, the technological infrastructure that we have on the one hand, and the threat perception on the other. So with conventional terrorism, I think we know more or less what they're capable of, but with cyber terrorism, we are still not, I believe that the common notion is that we still don't understand fully to what extent this can be a threat. So I think that the balance tips now for the existing <coughs> remedies, and we still have to see if there's going to be any change in threat perception, and that could come from the development of technologies, and it could come from some kind of a, what would be considered as a major event. Uh, just a few words on existing international organizations policy. Uh, some of you may know, NATO, just uh, the NATO summit in Wales, uh, declaration stipulated uh, a very important milestone in the issue of uh, cyber, cyber defense because 
according to this declaration, international law applies to cyber. Um, saying that uh, regarding Article 5, Article 5 is actually the trigger for military action on behalf of the NATO countries. And so they recognize that that is part of it, and that's following the very uh, in-depth study of the Tallinn Manual that was mentioned earlier. So legally, cyber is now considered a part of the threats that can cause NATO to react militarily. It's extremely important, uh, difficult to, to say how to react because that's also a very complicated issue in cyber. If you're cyber attacked, <coughs> you have to retaliate more or less in the same way. So you have to retaliate in cyber means, what kind of means against whom and so on. These are complex questions, but this is a milestone because this is actually the first time I think that an international organization comes up with a very clear message, cyber attack is a cause for military action. Uh, and you can see here on the, on the right hand side, cyber defense is part of NATO's core task of collective defense. So there is a very clear message there. And as Deb also mentioned, there is a group in the United Nations uh, first committee which deals with disarmament, a uh, government group of experts, uh, which Israel is a member of, um, that is supposed to present a report to the Secretary General regarding how international law applies to cyber. Um, it's not really cyber, it's ICT technologies, that's how it's defined in the, in the resolutions and the material. And the basic uh, in initiative came from Russia, uh, seeing that, and uh, I believe China as well, seeing uh, defining information as a possible weapon and therefore that's something that needs to be regulated and monitored. And at the moment, the recent report mentions, uh, recommends to deal with cyber terrorism, uh, but the, uh, the, the difficulty is of course, how do you deal with the part of terrorism, because that is still not defined in spite of all the efforts in the United Nations. There is still no agreement what constitutes terrorism. And the Israeli perspective is to look at cyber, what makes cyber different from other issues and how do we um, work together with our um, international uh, partners to make sure that ter cyber terrorism is addressed uh, in an appropriate way. So to conclude, um, there of course, um, it was mentioned here earlier, multilateral agreements are very important, but also bilateral cooperation is extremely important. I'm very happy to see here Bob Gordon, for example, from Canada and Italian friends and other countries that we're working very hard with to enhance global resilience against cyber attacks. Uh, sharing information is extremely important as well, and we have to uh, create and build confidence between countries to make that happen because it all relates to very sensitive information, where it, whether it's industrial or national or commercial. And the big question is, um, is there some, some kind of a cyber dome? And I go back to the first presentation of uh, Ophir that he mentioned international cooperation uh, that relates to companies and governments because I think that in this respect, we have to indeed think out of the box. He also mentioned that we have to think out of the box also globally. And um, Prime Minister Netanyahu mentioned in, in January in Cybertech conference, <coughs> was headed by uh, Rami Frati uh, in January, that we need to have some kind of an international agreement, some, time, some kind of an international institution that combines the technology and the policy together uh, to combat. And this relates very much to cyber terrorism because that's exactly the space that exists now um, between national defenses and national mechanisms and the, uh, and, and, and the non-state actors. And we need to be able to address that both from the technology side as well as from the policy side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ido. Okay, now we are with my presentation. Usually I wait for the end of the panel because I know that the people are too tired and I can say whatever I like. So I will uh, discuss the story of what is the uh, uh, global uh, uh, jihadist things about what we called cyber terror, but what they called electronic jihad. 
They call it electronic jihad because they need to, uh, to link everything that connected to their war to the jihad. And as you know, during Muhammad time, they didn't have uh, electronic materials, no iPhone, no uh, iPad, nothing. And they need a specific religious justification to bring the story of using the jihad with the electronic tools, meaning with the internet. What we can say very clearly during the years that uh, jihadists themselves, uh, they try to maintain their presence and activity on the internet all the time. Because this is, the w for them, it was wa one of the main tools for every operation that they need to do. What they uh, did also, they uh, spend a lot of efforts to defend the jihadist sites and system, not only using the internet, but also defend the internet for their uh, capabilities. They get an Islamic legal authority authorization, and believe me, there were a lot of religious justification and fatwas that published during the years that give them a permission to operate via the internet, not only just using the internet, but also using the internet for attack and all these kind of uh, operations. The next uh, uh, subject that we will discuss is develop the ability to attack and cause a significant damage to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, enemies, because in the eyes of the jihadists, uh, uh, using the internet as a platform of the attack is something that's very important, beside uh, intelligence, beside uh, military operation that they gather from the internet. They use it as a platform for what I we had here, DDoS attack and all these kinds of uh, issues. Another uh, topic that is very important in the eyes of the jihadists is to mobilize decentralized system to launch an attack. As we uh, heard here, to carry out a DDoS attack, you need people from the uh, different uh, uh, parts around the world. How to mobilize these people to carry out the operation? Meaning jihadists use the internet for operations, for defense, and for offense. Three uh, major uh, components. Let's put it in a, in a different way. What you can see that within the operation uh, a level of the uh, jihadists themselves, they share knowledge, they share training, they have a virtual training camp, they gather intelligence from the internet website, they gather uh, money, fundraising events, communication, and all these kind of operations. They can use it because they have the ability to use the platform of the internet, and Professor Gabi Weiman described the uh, enlarge of these uh, or increasing of these uh, 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 software capabilities and uh, uh, internet platform. Regarding defense, we can find out two different levels of defense when it comes to the story of uh, uh, this uh, organization. One is organizational level, second is personal level, and they use it for software and knowledge. You will find out within the Jihadi website, and we monitor for four years now Jihadi website, you can find out uh, instructions how to do, how to carry out these kinds of uh, defensive uh, operation. And you can find out on the other side, software that was developed by the jihadists to protect their, uh, a, their a, a infrastructure. Regarding the offense, we have an offense on organizational level and personal level. Also here, you can find out that there are involvement of software and involvement of knowledge. They establish capabilities, they establish units that they will take care on this kind of operation. They call it the Electronic Jihad Battalion, the Electronic Jihad Armies, uh, a Jihadist Internet Hacking Brigade, and all these kinds of names that you can understand that they are entering into this field of dealing uh, with the, the story of cyber uh, attack, cyber terror, and operating on the internet uh, 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 as an organization that can uh, get from it uh, what they need to run the organization uh, operation. Internet as a platform for operation, as uh, uh, Professor Gabi described, what we can see uh, different types and different involvement within the jihadi groups during the years. It started, everything it started with the media outlet. You need the group that will produce your uh, materials and disseminate the materials via the jihadi forum. So we have media outlet, we have a jihadi forum, we have a jihadi digital magazine, and we have a jihadi social network. It's a, a development that we find out within, during the years within this uh, a group. And we, uh, as uh, a, we, you heard here, there are an interactive connection between these, uh, uh, within this uh, uh, forum or this establishment. 
And believe me, one of the things that I found out uh, uh, very clearly that they have an interactive connection also through the digital uh, a jihadi magazine. Meaning in the magazine, they shed information and ask people to contact them and we will see some of this uh, information later. So you have here uh, a three uh, different publications that they call the Al-Qaeda Airlines. It's not that Al-Qaeda have a new airlines uh, uh, company. They use the name Al-Qaeda Airlines and they publish information within these groups that give their audience information about everything that connect to a terror attack, everything that connect to use lethal dose, everything that connect to use resine, poison, toxinology, what you, you decide, okay? Messages and everything that they are uh, posted on their website. And it was posted at the mid of 2013 onward, meaning they use the internet as the infrastructure, as a platform, to deliver information, knowledge about everything that they want to uh, promote to their uh, audience. And messages also. The next uh, uh, tool that they use, this is the Inspire magazine, but Inspire magazine is only one of the magazines. It was the first one that was published in English, but since then we have different uh, magazines that published in other places like Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, like uh, 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 Al-Qaeda in uh, uh, Iraq, ISIS, what we uh, know. This is the, the, the uh, uh, pictures of uh, another uh, digital magazine called Azan. They use the same system, the same methodology that used by Inspire years before, meaning we publish information for you, those people that speak English, and we have contact. We give you the ability to contact us and to send us information and to carry out an attack in different parts around the world. As you can see here, this is the public key. This is the uh, uh, code that they publish for their audience to use when they want to uh, uh, contact them, and we will see afterward how they uh, build this code and how they embedded this code. And they gave also the m email address of this organization. Please send us information to azan slash 2013 slash mail slash point ru. Meaning they or Yahoo.com. They used to give you the email address and they told you, you know, you can send us this information every, and everything is encrypted because we have our defensive tool here and uh, you will not be uh, captured. Another uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, recruitment for jihad. This is a story that was uh, uh, published by the Inspire magazine in 2012. They asked people to join uh, a, a, a project that they call it the Convoy of Martyr Project, meaning we want you to be a martyr who will give you the support, meaning it's not lone wolf. I totally agree with what you said. It's, lone, it's a lone wolf with a lot of package. We will give you uh, information, intelligence, training if you want to, or we just suggest you in what uh, uh, areas you can attack. This is our uh, uh, email addresses. They give them the email addresses, convoyformartyrsgmail.com. You can send us the information. What they find out afterward, that they have uh, uh, hacked or the uh, uh, security agencies enter into uh, uh, these projects, so they ask their audience via the Inspire magazine, through the magazine itself, uh, uh, some months later, stop sending us this kind of information, okay? The convoy martyr number one is closed, and then afterward, they uh, upload another information. We open the convoy martyr number two, meaning we have now a three, another safe capability. We give you another safe channel that you can uh, uh, volunteer to carry out jihad. And you can see they are very smiling because uh, we described it before, 72 version is a very good compensation. Next uh, a component that you can see is social network. They use the social network. I don't want to enter in more detail inside the social network, but believe me, every uh, a jihadist that is on the uh, operating on the uh, uh, internet try to take uh, find part within the social uh, network. Foreign fighters connected uh, a, to the social uh, uh, network, and they try to convince people to uh, carry out these kinds of operations. We see also blogs that were opened during the last years, Akim, a new blog, and other uh, uh, pieces of information. 
One of the things that it was very important in our eyes is to uh, try to understand how these groups gather information and intelligence via the internet. And as we it was said here, Google is a very good, uh, uh, Google Earth is a very good uh, source of information. So you can see here one of the major attacks that was carried out by the uh, uh, Yemenites. Uh, Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula uh, in December 2013, they uh, decided or they planned to attack and they attacked the, uh, a complex of uh, a, the Ministry of Defense. And if you remember, the, uh, after the attack of this complex, most of the information that was published uh, uh, publicly was that they attack a hospital. And uh, during the plan that they uh, uh, described for this attack, they used the, uh, a, a lot of information that came from the internet website. You can see this was taken from their clip. They get the plan. They have every. They gather the uh, uh, intelligence about the uh, uh, about the object. They gather everything that connect to the uh, a complex that they were attack. They uh, uh, decided to attack their the operational room that uh, were connected between the uh, United States uh, uh, that run the drones and the uh, Yemenite uh, 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 <coughs> Ministry of uh, uh, Defense. But at the end of the day, most of the attack was on the hospital that was part of this complex. And they used it afterward. The Yemenite government used it for propaganda. And uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula uh, it tried to uh, say that it was only a small mistake and they will uh, compensate the families that were died, uh, uh, that the members of the families were died there. As you can see, they use the internet. There are, this is another plan that they carried out an attack on the southern headquarters in Yemen, and they publish how they gather the information, they publish what is the uh, plan that they use, and you see very uh, a good, uh, uh, they have a very good uh, people that know how to use it, how to capture other people to show, to see that here it is, we are, a, this is a glorified of the operation that was carried out, and it, uh, as you can see also, and ISIS, they publish a lot of uh, a clip regarding how they uh, uh, succeeded to uh, carry out an operation on the ground. In another scale, within the uh, a story of uh, a, the digital magazine, they ask information and opinions how to deal with the phenomenon that really hurt them in this area. This is uh, uh, asking uh, for information about people that know how to deal with drones, how to deal with drones, because the drones uh, cause them a lot of uh, a, a problems uh, on the ground. And they gave the people the uh, contact, uh, the contact uh, uh, channels. Please contact us. This is uh, our emails. These are our emails. This is the key, uh, the public key, and so on and so on. Another topic that uh, we find out during the years that the jihadists use the uh, uh, internet for a fundraising campaign, you will find out within the jihadi forum, within the social network, call for support. In some cases, they give you in, uh, a, uh, a numbers of uh, a telephone, in some cases, the numbers of bank account, and you can uh, send these kinds of uh, uh, information or contact these uh, people. We find also within the darknet, it's uh, very difficult to uh, find information within the dar inside the darknet. We find inside the darknet also uh, uh, sites that ask for donation. We still search these areas of operation because we truly believe that the jihadists are really major actors in the darknet also, but we uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, reach to a very good uh, uh, result until yet, but we will continue. Regarding defense, the work assumptions of the jihadists uh, uh, during the years that internet is under attack and she, it must be protected. The, this is the, their work uh, assumptions and their protection uh, carried out in two different levels, the level of the group. In the level of the group, as we, you see uh, before, there is an encoding program, uh, there is uh, uh, a missionary, stenography, a backup, defense against hacking, meaning the level of the group, they have their uh, 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 what, what, what we call internet system, computer system that they are trying to uh, defend the level of the group. And there are a, a protection at the level of the personnel in two levels. One is guidelines. They send information how to behave in 
the internet, how to use internet cafe, how, my, how many time you will stay in the same internet cafe or try to find other internet cafe, uh, how to uh, establish your uh, the, uh, uh, software in your computer, how to deal with the people, how to, de to live within the two worlds, virtual world and real world, don't connect people in the real world to the virtual world, a lot of uh, uh, information about uh, a protection in the level of the personnel. <coughs> On the other side, they have an internet security book. The, this is the book of terror. They publish that they have a, 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 a chapter about internet security because they uh, want their people to be uh, more secure. They uh, developed uh, what we call a defense software or what they call a defense software. The most well-known uh, software that were developed called Asrar al-Mujahideen 2. This is the, na the name of the uh, software. It was uh, developed by the uh, uh, Global Islamic Media Front, meaning the main organization of uh, the main uh, uh, media outlet of uh, uh, Al-Qaeda. And what they, they developed it to ensure safe communication and they uh, developed also tools for mobile phone and uh, others. You can see here all the components of this uh, uh, for Android system, for uh, how to use Asrar al-Mujahideen, and so on, and so on. Asrar al-Mujahideen for Macintosh, those of uh, the jihadists that use Macintosh, we have for you Asrar al-Mujahideen for Macintosh, meaning we are trying to defend all our uh, uh, components that used uh, uh, via the internet. Problems, the, in the, uh, uh, during the uh, December 2013, uh, one of the jihadi websites published another uh, a software called Asrar al Ghuraba. And what we find out immediately afterwards that the Global Islamic Media Front, meaning the official uh, media front of Al Qaeda, published don't use this, uh, 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 this software because it's unofficial software and you don't, it do, we don't want you to use the unofficial uh, software. You can see also other uh, uh, examples of uh, a publication by uh, Gaza Hacker Kim, El Fajar, new software that uh, support the jihadists groups in different parts around the world. Individual defense, just different uh, uh, software that used by the jihadists all these information were uploaded to the jihadist forum, to the jihadist website, and the people can get inside the link, have the information, and use this, uh, a, a, this software. Uh, they like the Tor software, so you will find out in a lot of jihadi websites how to use Tor uh, as a software, not only for the darknet, also for the open uh, uh, internet. And they have a, a software, different uh, uh, versions of Tor software, and they send different indication how to use this uh, uh, software. And uh, uh, this is something that we need to understand that within the theaters of jihad in different parts, they use the uh, uh, defense for operation. Regarding offense, what we said, what we can say very clearly regarding the jihadists, they, ha they have high motivation to offense. They are in a learning curve but they have low capability. This is one of the uh, major uh, uh, insights that we can say after four years of uh, uh, research and investigation. What we find out regarding the cooperation, that there is a cooperation among terrorist groups, and there is a problem, the cooperation among terrorist groups and states. These are the most problematic uh, uh, components when it comes to the story of capabilities of offense, meaning, a terror organization that's supported by state equal Hezbollah supported by Iran, meaning Hezbollah has a very uh, a high capabilities when it comes to the story of terror, a uh, cyber terror attack. Terrorist groups are connected to criminal networks. So what we have, what we can say, although the terrorists are, have a learning curve capabilities, in the short time, they will not dramatic changes within this world in a short time, only in a short time, although I know that to predict something in, the, uh, in my uh, uh, areas of profession is very risky. Type of uh, uh, end goals when it comes to the offense, in jihadist groups carried out small scale attack that caused a site to collapse. Uh, jihadi groups involved in uh, cyber crime, jihadi groups involved in simultaneous attack, jihadi uh, groups connected to hackers, 
that provide information to the groups and provide instructions for hacking. So for time to time, you'll find out within the Jihadi website uh, uh, a courses about hacking. If you want to hack, this is the courses about hacking. Uh, and what we can see that in their eyes, the preferred attack targets are government websites and media websites. Sharing knowledge and attacking, this is uh, uh, some information about cyber attack. Op Israel, you just saw it. They uh, uh, upload these kinds of posters on the internet showing we carried out these attacks against you. Cyber terrorists and the level of the threat, what we uh, tried to do, we divided this world into, in some uh, areas, hackers, criminal, terrorists, uh, a international crime and state, and also uh, a jihadist that's sponsored by the state. What we said, that the level of the threat is connected to motivation plus capability, multiple frequency of the attack. So if I need to have an analysis about the actors that are operating in this field. This is the way that I put this uh, analysis. Motivation high, in some cases uh, the state, the motivation is low. Capability, jihadist, terrorist, and hackers is low. International crime is medium. State capability is very high, sponsored by the state is medium. Frequency of the attack and level of the threat. Take all this information and put it in a slide. What we have here is the uh, capabilities, low and high capabilities, frequency of the attack, low frequency and high frequency. And when I need to put all the actors on one place, you can see very clearly that although states have the high uh, uh, capabilities, they, are not, they don't have high frequency of the attack. The reason that they are here and not in the higher place of the level of the threat. This is the line of the level of the threat. When we can see the line of the level of the threat, we can say that jihadist group that's sponsored by the state are very, uh, uh, it, it's a very high in this uh, a line. International criminal also medium high in this, uh, a, on this line. Criminals and hackers are very uh, a low here. Terrorists are here. But there are changes. Well, in the time of war, state became the uh, very high level threat when it comes to the uh, story of the, uh, of the cyber, and terrorists are on the learning curve. They want to improve their capabilities, and this is the reason why investigate this phenomenon, because we believe that they are learning all the time, and they uh, uh, are uh, trying to uh, uh, change their uh, capabilities. Okay, we have another two minutes. When it comes to the organization use of the virtual and the uh, real world, we must uh, uh, understand that they are the jihadists themselves operating not only in the virtual world, not only in the real world, they are operating in, in two of these uh, worlds, and this is the reason why it became more uh, a threat that uh, uh, these jihadists carried out the operation. You ha have here all the scale. I don't want to enter a, a, a lot of details into this uh, story because it will take time. Uh, it will take us time, and we have only uh, uh, 10 minutes, and I want at least one round of questions. So I skip it and uh, try to describe another uh, concept uh, in a very short time. Uh, we get uh, we uh, uh, research information that uh, came from uh, uh, an analysis regarding state and cyber terror counter policy, and we analysis the analysis is based on 30 states, uh, the national strategy of 30 states regarding the threat of cyber terror, and what you can see very clearly that only 50 percent of the state that did this analysis and they have their national strategy, believe that the terrorists can use, carried out a terror attack. Uh, a 22% said that the, terror, the jihadists use the internet only as a platform, and 25% of the state from these 30 states, national strategy of the state, 25% uh, didn't mention the, the problems of uh, uh, a terror attack, possible terror attack on their uh, groups. You have here the USA International Strategy for Cyberspace, 
They really understand the, the uh, uh, nature of the threat of cyber terror. They understand the, the nature of the threat of hackers for hire. As you know, today, if you want somebody to carry out this kind of operation for you, you need to hire him, pay some money, and he will carry out a DDoS attack for you. He will uh, develop for you a Trojan horse. He will develop for you everything. So they know that there are uh, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, operations. Also in UK, they understand that uh, uh, Al Qaeda and global jihadists uh, promoted their capabilities within this world, and we will not enter into uh, a, in more detail into this issue. If I need to sum up what happened in 2013 regarding operational uh, use the internet for oper operation, we have a major focus by the uh, global jihadists. We see increasing use of the internet as a platform for these kinds of uh, operations. Regarding defense, we have a medium uh, evolution within the jihadist group. Regarding offense, what we find out that there is a minor progress, high priority in the organization policy, high motivation, but low capability. This is, uh, if I need to sum up uh, these issues. And uh, I end it with uh, just a happy uh, a note that uh, we surprised, they surprised, I don't know who surprised in this uh, game, but the reality is that we need to gather all the time information and to understand how these organizations developed uh, uh, during the year. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy that nobody stopped me. And uh, we have uh, five minutes, so I invite the... Uh, our colleague to sit here, and uh, we have uh, one round of questions. If somebody have a question in a minute, just let them sit. <laughs>